Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining us for our fourth Let's Talk series to go along with the Stand Against Racism Challenge. Um, my name is Beth Cato, and I'm the Director of Racial and Social Justice for YWCA Delaware. And I've really been enjoying our conversations and the different things that we've talked about. <clears throat> and of course, as usual, I'm excited for our panel tonight. Um, we decided to do something a little bit different, although a lot of the content was based around film. We wanted to talk a little bit about, um, all the way around, about um, racism and representation in film and media. Um, so with us today, we have um, Akima A. Brown. She's the founder of Real Families for Change. She's a filmmaker and community, community advocate. Michael Freely, he's the executive director of Delaware Online News Journal. Um, and David Stradley, uh, producing artistic director of Delaware Shakespeare. So thank you all for being here tonight. I'm wondering if we couldn't just go around a little bit and talk a little bit about what you do for a living. It doesn't have to do with um, our topic, but just kind of, um, Akima, I'm gonna start with you because I think you have three hats. Um, and, and so why don't you give us a little bit of, of what kind of each one of those are. Sure thing. So um, hello everyone. First of all, thank you so much again Beth, for putting this together. Uh, my name is Akima A. Brown. And as you heard, I, have a, um, I'm the founder of a nonprofit organization called Real Families for Change. And we basically look at the way we work in film and television. And so we really want to create workplace wellness and a structure of workplace wellness that identifies, you know, centering the worker and the person. Uh, so a lot of our work really deals in advocacy, but also in collecting data and then using that data to inform. And so, um, that's one hat. <laughs> but then also, I am a filmmaker. I'm an indie writer and producer. Um, I came to Delaware for family and so really excited to be here in this region and doing this work to really see how our industry can potentially grow in our state. So very, very excited about that. Um, and I am a mother and a caregiver predominantly. So that's, you know, everything else that I do is informed by that. So Absolutely. yeah, those, that's, that's it in a nutshell. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And Michael? <clears throat> yes, uh, my name is Mike Feely, and as you said, I'm the executive editor of uh, the News Journal in Delaware Online. I'm also the regional editor for Mid Atlantic Editor for Gannett, so I oversee news sites in Pennsylvania, Southern New Jersey, Delaware, and Maryland. Uh, I've been in this uh, the newspaper industry for uh, longer than I'd like to admit, probably 35 years. I spent 30 years in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, as the director of content for Penn Live and the Patriot News. Uh, and you know, I'm a, from a newspaper family, my father was an editor in suburban Philadelphia. So, uh, two kids, both grown and out. So, uh, my wife and I, who've lived here for about four years in Delaware, just sort of exploring every corner of Delaware that we can. Thanks for having me. Thanks for being here. Uh, David? Hi, everybody. David Stradley. I'm the uh, producing artistic director of Delaware Shakespeare. We're a professional theater in our 20th year of operations. And um, uh, our why, our, our vision is to try to make Delaware a place where people from all walks of life can gather to celebrate and explore their shared humanity through Shakespearean works. We do that in, in two main ways. Uh, we do a summer festival every year at Rockwood Park. Um, and then in the fall, well, most falls, it's been on a COVID pause for the last two years. Uh, but normally in the fall, we do our, our community tour where we take another play on the road, trying to reach the full spectrum of humanity in our state of Delaware by traveling to locations like prisons and homeless shelters, community centers, mental health facilities, um, anywhere we can get where people may have uh, limited or no access to the professional arts. Uh, I've been a I will never, I can never claim to be a Delawarean, but I've lived here 20 years now. It feels, it feels like home. Uh, and I'm a proud, uh, a proud clay monster uh, residing in Claymont, Delaware with my, uh, my lovely wife. Thank you. Where'd you go to high school, David? Not a, at Sacramento High School in Sacramento, California. So I can never, I can never answer that question in the authentic Delawarean way. <laughs> I, yes, I'm sure everyone on here from Delaware knows that the ultimate Delaware question is not where you went to college, where'd you go to high school? Because that way we know as a Delaware high school graduate, if you are originally from Delaware. <laughs> Not that there's any power in that at all. It's usually just Delaware so small, you know somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody. That's really what it's more about. So um, Akima, tell me a little bit about your uh, nonprofit and um, what 
why you started it? Like what was, what is the vision that you see or the um, issue that you see that kind of needs to be solved by Rails of Change? Um, that's a great question. <laughs> so the, the real, I guess, meat behind why the organization was created essentially was looking at family friendliness in the industry as a whole. Um, but then recognizing, so for instance, just to give a bit of background for those folks who may not be familiar, um, a lot of times in the industry, you're talking about working, you know, 12, 14, 16 hour days, you're talking about not really having a reasonable turnaround for getting back to set for call the next morning. Um, you know, you're talking about hazardous work conditions a lot of the time. Um, there's, you know, quite a bit in terms of especially our crew and those working below the line and, and folks who are working in the, the um, grip and electric section, you have folks who are really dealing with a lot of um, heavyweight materials and things of that nature. So it's a lot, it can be quite debilitating. And so we were thinking, we really need to address and acknowledge the fact that families are not really conducive to this industry. Like you can't really have a family structure. But then we realized that there are a lot of systemic issues that take place that hinder even that conversation. And it depends on whose family are we talking about and who deserves to have that time and so on. And so our goal and our vision is really creating an equitable system where everyone has an opportunity to thrive in the industry, regardless of what marginalized population they may, you know, um, identify with. And that includes caretaker obligation as well. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I was just going to ask. So, so kind of the idea is <clears throat> we know um, maybe single parents who have kids who are uber talented, but don't have the luxury of having that time when everybody else is, is recording or filming or writing because they have to put food on the table. But exactly. you're, you're talking about let's support these families and how can we give them support that they need to be able to, to tap into their art? Absolutely. And it, it goes even beyond once you start to break that down into certain racial demographics, it, it gets even more complicated because you're talking about, you know, wage gap issues, you're talking about child care accessibility, child care desert, um, particularly in the age of COVID. So you have, say, a Black filmmaking mother who is in need of these services, who's making less on the dollar, on top of needing to work additional hours, on top of having inaccessibility to child care, on top of, so it becomes easier for her to simply say, I'd rather not be in this industry at all, then I'm going to try to work all these things out and figure this out. So that's really where RSD comes in and that we're looking at how can we take on some of these systemic challenges in order to offset that, that issue for a lot of parents. And we have done a lot over the course of the pandemic with providing you know, accessibility incubators, with doing training um, for decision makers and offering subgrants to parents in the industry to kind of offset that and particularly looking at our BIPOC, our BIPOC mothers in the industry and how we can potentially, you know, provide them with the necessary services so they can stay at work and they don't have to choose between, you know, do I make up? And we always say you shouldn't have to choose between doing work you love and building a life with those you love. Like those two things shouldn't be mutually exclusive. I love that. I love that. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> David, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that over the last couple of years, Delaware Shakespeare has made um, intentional movements to do something similar to what Akeem is talking about and um, maybe changing the times of auditions or practices um, to be able to be more inclusive of um, other populations that might not have the luxury of just being able to come whenever. Am I correct in that? Yeah, so over the last two years, yeah, during, during the pandemic and then specifically, um, sparked by the, the murder of George Floyd, um, we've, we've done a lot of work to first and foremost create an anti-racism policy and plan. Um, but la last year was kind of the, the first year we really put that into, into action. And one of the things we realized as we were putting into action that there's, that it goes, it goes broader than just the demographic of, of race. Um, yeah, and looking at caregiver support and, um, you know, and, 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 and other elements. So yeah, we've been, we've been working to try to create policies and practices that are, that are more uh, human-centered. 
great. Thank you. Um, and is that working? <laughs> um, <laughs> are, are you able to have, or, or are you just now because of COVID actually um, coming out and being able to like, um, how many plays have you been putting on and have you been able to pull a more uh, diverse um, participation? Yeah, I, I want to, uh, I guess, acknowledge as well in this, in this conversation about racism representation that as a as a, as a white man, I'm I'm not the, the demographic that is that is most uh, directly impacted by by all this. I want to most of what I'll share today. I want to thank um, a lot of the the BIPOC artists and audiences that have that have shared their their experiences and, and stories with us. Um, so I just want to thank people thank for their for their generosity in 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 sharing with us and and letting us know how how they've been impacted by things that our organization has done and how how we can become better um, in the future. Um, so yeah, no, Delaware Shakespeare, I mean, we, while we have not, this summer will be our first year getting back to doing our full uh, outdoor Rockwood production, but we've certainly been very, very busy in the last two years. Um, and last year, we were able to do a, a full production of A Midsummer Night's Dream at Rodney Square um, and several other sorts of programs. And so one of the specific shifts that we're making is, is last year was the first year on, on every production. Um, we we had what we called an anti-racism liaison on the production where we paid one of the actors um, an actor of color a, a little bit more money um, to to kind of be the the point person on on issues that may have ar arose during during the production um, and we got good feedback about having that sort of position um, but again listening and learning it was identified that it is placing it's, it's a valuable thing to do to make sure you have that kind of position, um, but that it's a lot to ask of an artist who is already <laughs> doing something on, on the production. Um, so this year we're shifting to a, what we're calling a community care liaison, which will be a separate uh, position. Um, and yes, grounded in values of anti-racism, but also looking at yeah, caregiving issues and, and gender issues and, and that sort of thing. So that's that's one, one of the, you know, we were able to apply that last year and then uh, got feedback about how it was, how it was working and making a shift now, now this year. Uh, you know, one of the things I'm learning is you, you try and then ask how it went and then make adjustments to try to do it better. Yeah, no, thank you. And, and I think that's, um, that's great that you're able to receive that feedback and just make it better because that's really what I think we're all after is making it better. Um, <clears throat> Michael, Michael's in the newspaper industry. Newspaper industry gets really rough rap. And I know, <laughs> um, good or bad, I don't know, from every which angle, not just when it comes to race, but um, with, I know it, that um, Gannett, I, know, I definitely know Delaware Online, um, and I'm assuming Gannett as well, has made um, intentional strides to not, I mean, we can start with, um, you know, mug shots, but I think has made an intentional move towards not bringing that bias directly into their uh, journalism. So if you don't mind talking about that. I, I think really what we describe it as we've been on this, you know, three to four year journey to kind of change the newsroom culture to repair relations with uh, communities we've kind of long ignored. So really the first step of that was kind of an acknowledging the distorting effects that uh, just highlighting crime news, for example, in, in neighborhoods without balancing that with you know positive coverage has a long-term effect. And some of our public safety reporting really had limited news value. It was more writing for entertainment than, than for news quality. So we really sort of had to admit that we were, you know, we were, not fulfilling all of our duties as a news organization to inform the public. So, and, you know, and that kind of reporting often led to kind of people overestimating their likelihood of becoming a crime victim or engaging in racial stereotyping. And, and so what we really had to do is we had to take a look at ourselves about what is it we were reporting about crime. And, you know, the first things we did is we got rid of you know, the mugshot galleries. And then we started asking ourselves, well, what crimes are we going to cover? And we, we kind of had to make a decision that if we were not going to follow a case all the way through, because as we, as we all know, charges are altered, dropped, you know, it disappeared, the case just disappears suddenly and there's no coverage after it disappears. If we weren't going to follow it all the way through, we weren't going to cover it. So we started slowly raising the bar. What is it we're going to cover? It has to have a community impact. It can't be just the, you know, you know, the stories that are commonly in our business refer to the Florida man stories, you know, the, all those stories that a hey, Florida man, dot, 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 dot. Uh, we wanted to try to avoid those kinds of stories. So, um, 
So we really made that strong effort to say, we're not just going to take press releases from the police department. We're going to work more in stories about the impact of crime on the community, not just that a crime happened, but why and what behind it. But uh, we did find that the, the, the mug shots were very, you know, like, like anything else, mug shots were selective. Who, who we, were we getting mug, mug shots of? They're very selective of, you know, uh, of who they, we set, they were sent out and uh, the ones that we received. And when you start looking at them, and when you find that the white population of Delaware, like anywhere else, commits many, 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 many more numbers of crimes than, say, the Black population or people of color, yet the number of mug shots that are released to the public are more a high degree of people of color. So we sort of have to ask ourselves, why was that happening? And we had to take a deep look. So we just decided to make the, the, the call that we're just not gonna run them anymore. Uh, there was no point in running them other than for show. So it's been this kind of journey as uh, it, it, about finding how, like what was our role in this and admitting our faults uh, in this issue and how do we do better? But at the same time, now we're bringing on reporters that internally we call underserved community reporters. And really their job is to go into the communities that we've ignored and find stories and tell them. So this is not a mission accomplished speech by, by any means, uh, but it is the beginnings of what we hope here locally and through the Gannett Company as a whole uh, are, 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 are trends that we will continue to follow up on. Great. Um, just a quick follow-up question. Mm -hmm. Are the individuals that you send into those communities, are they representative of those communities? Yes, that is our hope uh, that yes. they are. Yes. Okay. Uh, that is uh, when we when we hire, we're specifically not specifically hiring for a, a demographic target, but we're we're trying to diversify the staff to go into diverse communities to represent. So you know, our argument too is the, the and it's a very hard task. Uh, uh, it is a very hard, it's, it's not as easy as we even thought it would be. Oh, we need to diversify our news. That is very difficult. Um, but when we, you know, diverse voices bring diverse, diverse thought and diverse, diverse opinion. And, it, and it's great to have kind of conversations with all kinds of diverse opinions mm -hmm. about what's happening with an issue. So we find the more we diversify our staff, the more the opinions are diversified. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think um, that's something that I think that we've all learned. And it's interesting to me sometimes when businesses still push back, when we know that businesses that are out there to make money, they know that they make more money when they have a diverse audience. So um, <clears throat> actually that's gonna bring me to another question and we're gonna pop around a little bit, but just because it triggered it. So um, Akima, that is like one of the, one of the things I was reading about is how movies are now trying to tap into the audience that they have neglected and, um, and how profitable they have found that it can be. Um, can you talk a little bit about, you know, about that? So I have, I, <laughs> I can, I can talk a lot about that actually. Um, there's long since been a history of diversity in Hollywood. However, it, when we talk about diversity, it's the diversity that did not take place in the mainstream. So what I mean by that is you've always had quote unquote black Hollywood, black cinema, um, that's always existed. The diversification is now coming in that the mainstream is beginning to realize that there is dollar value. Like if you look at, I think every year there's, I'm trying to remember exactly what standards and poor, um, what the number was for this year, but you know, just in terms of the black dollar and, and how the black dollar circulates throughout the GDP and, and just how much power there is in that. And so now people are trying to kind of tap into that market. My contention with that though, is we have to be careful that we are not always just trying to check the box, that we're not simply saying, oh, this is what's going to bring in the dollars. So let's go ahead and do that thing. Are we actually acknowledging authentic representation? Are we actually bringing characters to the screen who have depth and who have, you know, is it not just the stereotypical comic release and things of this nature? And how exactly do we go about that? And um, I will try not to go down the rabbit hole and keep this short, but a lot of that comes from who the decision makers are but we're not seeing the same rate of growth in terms of who's at the decision-making level as we are in terms of the, the content being made. So we're bringing quote unquote stars 
to make these movies, but then we're not bringing in people who can actually speak to how these movies are driven and how they're built out. And the reason for that, in my personal opinion, is because we're trying to bring in more numbers and we're not actually looking at the culture in which we're making these films and bringing people into. And so, um, Michael, I think you made a great point about changing the newsroom culture because the culture really is where it all comes into. Um, at RFC, we talk about first do no harm. And this idea of, you know, if you're just bringing in more people to check a box and say, we did the thing, you're actually bringing in more people to be harmed because you're bringing them into an environment that does not actually treat them well or fare well for them. So um, that for me, I love, I want to see so much more content. I'm a huge sci-fi fan. I want to see all kinds of sci-fi that, you know, stars, you know, people of color and that look at exploring worlds of lore in terms of, you know, ancient Africa and all of that. I want to see all of that, but I want to see it done well. And I want to see it done true to form. And I want to see people who are driving the same kinds of, you know, conversations around Lords of the Ring, also driving, you know, people who are representative of that history, driving that. So it, yes, it's happening, but I still think we have a long way to go in terms of how we go about actually doing it well and bringing it about well. So is Ava DuVernay doing it well? Yeah, now, listen. I, that's Auntie Ava to anyone who's listening. I know, oh, no. I know. <laughs> I, I, I want you to talk I, about I, why she's doing it right. I want you. Yes, yeah. she yes. is. So she is, and the reason I say that is because it's it's multi layered, and I think she's doing a fantastic job of it. One, not just looking at who she's bringing in, but how she's bringing them in. So having this wonderful list of BIPOC talent and bringing them on, but then also looking at how they're working. And what kinds of environment and culture are we bringing them into? Actually, I, I love what she did. I, I will be totally honest. I grew up in New York City during the whole um, Central Park Five, and I, so I did not. So I'm not watched it. It's you don't have to me, but but knowing that she took the time and care and consideration to bring a therapist on set because it wasn't just enough to make the film. It needed to be made in such a way where people were taken care of in the process working shorter days, pre-planning, grouping, just all the things that she's looking to do and how she's doing it. She's doing it well. That, that's how you do it well. It's bringing in this diversification, going into the community, talking to folks, seeing what it is that's missing, what's needed, doing your homework, your research, building a plan out of that, and then making sure that that structure actually meets the needs and overcomes the pain point. That's She's doing it well. Yes, Auntie yeah. Ava. Yeah. She's doing the thing. And I, I think even how she's building her coalition of others to say, I'm not doing this alone. Here's how you can help support this movement and this initiative. I think that's, I think that's phenomenal. So yes, I think she's doing it well in terms of how she's diversifying the content on screen, diversifying the scenes behind the scenes, diversifying how she's actually going about the workplace culture and shifting and you know that transformative culture and how she's doing I think she's doing a great job yeah yeah agreed and I'm just curious um it's probably a no-brainer kind of answer but there there's obviously a ton of money in film media etc um <clears throat> do you think that I don't do you think that some white people are are going to kind of try to model her absolutely they already are yeah, <laughs> they are. You are, you you will find, unfortunately, you will find a great deal of these lists, and these lists are, you know, they they highlight uh, diverse workers and and diverse creators, mm -hmm. and they are predominantly run by individuals who have historically demonstrated that they have no care or consideration mm -hmm. for any. Let's let's be very frank. Anyone who's working for them, regardless of you know color race so forth and so but they know that there is profit in this mm -hmm. so again ticking off a box right. choosing to tick off a box instead of looking at how do we center people how do we center humans i love that you said that david how do we center humans in this conversation to ensure that it's not just a box check and unfortunately you have folks who that's that's all it is to them and what i do appreciate that's never been proven sustainable it does fall apart. Sometimes it takes a while, but it does fall apart. So if they don't get it together, that'll fall Motown. Apart. Motown's a kind of a 
Oh, where did you go? I don't know. So oh, there you are. <laughs> screen just went black. I thought <laughs> for anyone who's watching, I've been having technical difficulties on this side. We do not know why, <laughs> but I'm I'm doing my best to be here and make it work. So, no, appreciate yeah. it. Appreciate it. And and by the way, anybody who has any questions, please pop them in the chat. Um, you know, if you've been here before, you you know how this goes. If you have any questions for any of our panelists, or you just have a comment that you want to feed into what we're kind of discussing about. Um, so, David, you mentioned the summer production, and you might have said what you're doing already, did you? This summer, we're doing The Tempest. Oh, okay. All right. So, when do you start that? Or have you already? We start I mean, rehearsals practice in, and stuff. We start rehearsals in mid-June and then perform it in, uh, in July. Okay. So, can people um, go out for it right now? Or is, when are the... Or do you already have people select? Yeah, we are. We are. Com we are complete, or for the most part, we are completely personnelled up for okay. for for the tempest. Yeah. Okay, great. And then um, the Delaware Shakespeare is nonprofit, correct? Correct. Yeah. So when you were saying there's a lot of money in film, I was like, well, that's that's not true in theater. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not true in theater. Yeah. No. I mean, unless you get a big name, um, or <laughs> or your um, oh my goodness, his name's leaving me right now, and I'm not going to think of it. Um, uh, that's okay. It'll come back to me. Um, so, okay. Um, so Michael, are you, do you find that there's a, a, a decent amount of diversity actually? And I think you kind of touched on this. There's not like in the profession itself. And, um, if not, which that's kind of the feel I get from some people, why do you think that is? Is it for the same? I'd say reason? no, I'd say no. And it, it, I'm not sure, um, you know, from, College on down, it was a, a welcoming environment, and um, and we need to work on that. We're involved now with two organizations, and, and including ourselves, in kind of working and training with uh, diverse uh, interns each summer. Um, so we we will bring three diverse interns again on on uh, staff this summer, and um, you know, go through the training program. We hired, we've already hired one person from that program. Uh, we'd like to sort of create our own pipeline. Um, but we need to, you know, the industry as a whole has to uh, work on that. I know uh, Gannett as a whole is working on a large internship program with HBCUs okay. uh, for company-wide, again, to develop, um, a, 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 you know, a, a place to recruit from, a place mm -hmm. to, you know, uh, but, you know, journalism is a, a, a skill you learn by doing, and you got to give people shots, and you got to give people uh, get people in the door, entry level internships, writing uh, things like that, uh, and we we do have to do a better job of 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 doing that. And I think we're making some great strides now. Um, uh, our press association, which is the uh, Maryland Delaware DC Press Association, runs one of the programs, and they get grant money to provide us a free intern. So we have a, a young woman who will be starting with us uh, late May, and then uh, the Delaware Community Foundation uh, uh, sponsors another program that we're working with, and uh, uh, that young man starts also in late May, uh, and we work with UD as well. Um, so I, we think if we just keep uh, recruiting, if we keep um, training programs, it, it's a, it, again, these are journeys, you know, mm -hmm. uh, we don't have openings all the time. So when you have some, when you have openings, you got to make smart choices and you got to make, you know, and, and do a lot of searches. But the good news, I think, is if you're a diverse journalist now, the market is yours and you, there are plenty of opportunities around the country. Um, and and that's a good thing. And you can find yourself on, you know, at somewhere like the Philadelphia Inquirer or the Washington Post or the New York Times and things like that. Um, and that's a good thing as, as media outlets try to diversify. Yeah, the Atlantic does a good job of having that, that huge amount of uh, diversity and brilliant voices, in my opinion. Um, have you thought about partnering with DSU at all yet? So we've had we've had in the past members of our staff who who've uh, taught there and we're I've already put a note into Gannett about working with DSU next year as part of the HBCU internship program. They were not a part of the initial one because most of those were in the South. Uh, it was a pilot program that they're going to be expanding. So I already fired off that email. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. OK, great. Yeah. Because and, and I appreciate the fact I think you said that your the grants are going to pay the individuals. Um, because I think that's one of the biggest, you know, in any industry, to be very honest, it's one of the biggest barriers is that 
there's a certain part of our population that can afford to work for free. And there's a certain part that can't. Neither one should have to work for free. Let me establish that. But those that get the experience are those who can have that luxury. And that's, I think for a long time, that has been why it's been, <clears throat> and I'm going to say the boys club or whatever, whatever it's been, you know, I think that's because you, you pull up who's in your circle. And so the idea is to just broaden our circles and then we're pulling up the talent and not necessarily just, not that the people aren't talented, but um, so Akima, did you want to say something? You look like you're about to. No, I actually, um, I had questions <laughs> um, just about, you know, any of the organizations that look predominantly at BIPOC talent. And do you think it's more of a regional something? Because that, that is something I encounter a lot in terms of um, diversifying throughout the state and, and different spaces throughout the state. And so I was just wondering from Michael, if it's something he thought was more regional or is it industry pervasive? I think it's a little of both. Uh, it, it's interesting to me. <laughs> um, I don't want to insult anybody on the call, but sometimes when I'm on calls for internship programs, I still get the is Delaware State question. Uh, you know, where is Wilmington? Uh, things like that. Joe Biden's helped a little bit of people understanding where Delaware is on a national level. But I think it's a little bit about industry and I think it's a little bit about regional. We have some really good journalism programs in the region. I mean, top notch journalism programs at Penn State University, at Temple University, at University of Maryland. So they surround us. And it's just about us working a little bit harder um, to attract talent. And, and you know, while, while we've always paid interns, um, you're right, it is a struggle because we all know renting an apartment in the Wilmington area or anywhere is really expensive and then try to get a short-term apartment if you're an intern. So we, we, we have to work on when we're bringing someone in, you know, how do we help them get situated? Because most internships are 10 to 12 weeks. Um, you know, you're here for summer break, you do as much writing as you can and then and, and out and how can we help them? Um, it's not an easy uh, problem to solve. Yeah, thanks. There's um, a good question in the chat, actually. I think it's for you, Michael. Um, how has the closing of so many print news sources affected the hiring? Sorry, somebody else put in there. How affected the hiring internship options for BIPOC candidates? So the good news, bad news scenario is that while <laughs> uh, print organization, listen, print is on the decline. Print readership is on the decline. As much as it pains me to say that, you know, from a legacy, but journalism isn't necessarily in a decline. Startups are happening all the time. Nonprofits are happening all the time. It's just a digital audience. It's a digital audience. We have a lot of digital growth. We have startups happening right here in Delaware, right? So they are starting up in, in, in areas like that. And that's a good thing. A healthy journalism environment is a good thing. So I, to be honest, I think the, the, the environment that we're in right now is the best ever for journalist <laughs> students of color to get internships because every news organization in the United States is looking to diversify and they're, and they're looking to get diverse journalists. It is uh, diverse uh, uh, intern candidates. Um, it's a good market right now. The, 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 the sort of slow death of print medium doesn't really impact that at all because the digital media is growing so quickly, including with Delaware Online. Yeah, people can um, also read everywhere as opposed to just having it. Yeah. Book, you know, I tell people it's really never been a better time to be a journalist. You reach a much broader audience. You can affect change a lot quicker. You can reach more people because you, it's right on their phone. The news is now coming right on your phone. And, and the majority of our readers are getting their news on their phone, not their desktop, not their laptop, or whatever. It's on the phone. Um, so we can reach them right there through through many mediums. And you know, our goal is to how do we create a model where we can survive you know, subscriber only digital audience so we can be around for you know another 150 years. Um, and part of that is by attracting readers we didn't have before. And that's what we're talking about today. Yeah. Um Akim, how has streaming affected uh the industry for BIPOC? Um uh, artist. So one of the things that we're finding particularly, and 
most of what we've discussed really has been more from a studio standpoint, not even really necessarily indie. Um, indie is an entirely different piece altogether. Uh, but as it pertains to streaming, because that does fall into the um, the sort of studio catalog, um, it's it's seeing a lot of the same trends as traditional, you know, movie media, moving media. Um, I think what where we are seeing quite a bit of difference is not the streaming, but more so content creation. That's really where the opening is, where you have people who, similar to finding journalism on your phone, um, people are creating content from their phones. And I think that there's a lot there with regard to how people are able to break in and sort of move themselves into and position themselves into spaces where then they can sort of say, you know, leverage their talent. Um, and that again, kind of, sometimes it works out for them in the studio space, but a lot of times that really looks like opening doors into that independent filmmaking and independent direction. And that's always good because then you, um, I'm trying to follow the chat too. <laughs> you, but then you also have folks who, because they're coming into that, indie is a great pipeline to studio, if that's something you desire, there are ways to work that out. So I think that that's really where a lot of that comes in, um, in terms of, diversifying and and exploring how we can expand content content creation really has been on the up and up for that the only issue there we have seen in you know cases of like tiktok and ig and different things where there are some you know erasure conversations that do happen where people are replicating content from bipoc creators and not giving them credit things of that nature and so i am grateful for the initiatives that are now taking place that are, you know, the algorithms. And again, this is, I'm a nerd, so data is like, yes. Um, but those algorithms that allow for any content created by, by pop creators, it still traces them. So even when you do not tag them, the algorithm acknowledges that they created it so that they can get the necessary credit. And then they can take those impressions and leverage that again to move into whatever it is that they desire to do next, whether, you know, some form of traditional media, offline movies, things like that. So streaming wise, it hasn't seen too much of a shift, um, but content creation is really a, a, a brand new wave. And even the fact that sag after is recognizing content creators in their you know, eligibility requirements like that, I think that's really where we're seeing an open door for a lot of BIPOC creators. Yeah, yeah, <clears throat> thank you for that. Um, <laughs> Sorry, I, I apologize. I have a bit of a cold, um, probably like most of the world. Um, so there's some stuff in the chat, but I'm going to tell you, it all seems to be going um, towards a particular topic that we're not covering tonight, which is misinformation in the media. That is for another night. That is a whole different conversation, um, which I'm not so sure my ED would even want me to step into. <laughs> So I, it's not that I'm ignoring your your uh, your questions. It's just kind of not where we want to go with the conversation tonight. Um, <clears throat> so David, have you guys thought about doing anything different? And I know this sounds really weird than Shakespeare or doing Shakespeare in a different way. No, that, that's the, I was going to jump in and, and go to that exact point uh, because you know Akeem was talking about new content creation um, and part of the challenge of running a Shakespeare company is, you know, there isn't any new content coming from Shakespeare anymore. You know, he's, he's dead 400 years. The plays have, plays have stopped coming. Um, but, you know, when we, were, when we were looking at our past history and kind of how we can do better job with, with representation, um, one of our honest questions, well, how do you do that when, you know, you're Delaware Shakespeare? Um, and for most of our history, you know, we've done one play, maybe two plays a year. Um, so it seemed like if, if we're doing one to two plays, and we're called Delaware Shakespeare, they probably should be Shakespeare. Um, um, but we have started expanding it in recent years. And one of the things we are, are launching this year, in fact, our, our, our first, first go at this is Thursday night, um, but we're uh, starting a series called Beyond Shakespeare, where we put diverse creative voices in, in conversation with Shakespeare's play. So you asked uh, Becca, you know, what play we're doing this summer? And I said, we're doing The Tempest. Um, there is a play written by a Caribbean author, Aimé Césaire, called A Tempest, where he takes the plot of The Tempest, reimagines it from a Caribbean standpoint, and uses it to look at colonialism and how and different forms of resisting colonialism. 
Um, so we'll be doing a reading of, of scenes from, from that play at Artscape in downtown Wilmington on, on Thursday with a pay what you decide program. Um, and then I talked about our, our community tour, uh, which is the production that we travel around the state going into homeless shelters and prisons and, and whatnot. Um, this fall, again, hopefully COVID willing, um, we have a, a new adaptation of Shakespeare's comedy Twelfth Night um, that's going to be a bilingual musical Spanish English adaptation of the play that that takes this play and uses it as a a way to look at immigration. Um, so the the play Twelfth Night uh, starts with twins Viola and Sebastian getting shipwrecked on Illyria. Um, in our adaptation, uh, Viola and Sebastian are from Venezuela, um, and Illyria will feel a decent amount like contemporary America. <laughs> um, so certainly, you know, one of our challenges is how how do we authentically pursue representation in content with Shakespeare. Um, but there's a whole history of people taking Shakespeare and, and jumping off and, and being inspired by it and telling different stories with it. Um, so that's, that's kind of how we're looking at the idea of, of, of new content creation I think, when it comes to Shakespeare and representation. I love that, I love that. And um, I think uh, David just said it was this Thursday at Artscape. Yeah. And you, it was called Pay Pay what you decide. So you can go to our website, dillshakes.org, and uh, there's cool. $5, $10, $15 options, or, or a free option. We want to invite as, as welcome as many people as possible to, to explore this play and have a discussion with us about it. Wonderful. That's great. And did you say you're having a discussion afterwards or in between? The... It's inter interwoven through the whole evening. That's great. That's awesome. Having some dialogue. Um, that's a good way to do things. Sorry, I'm, I'm going. I'm going in between the chat and my question. So, um, yes, Tracy, I'll, it's um, is it dellshakes.org? I'll throw it in there. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Um, so, uh, um, someone's um, said they are they're concerned about local print journalism. Um, they continue to have subscription to the Daily News Journal. How can we support and broaden support of print journalism? <coughs> and can you talk about the Build Back Better program to assist print journalism? I assume I that's to me. What? what? <laughs> Is that to me? <laughs> yes. Sorry, Mike. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, if if I had the answer to that, I you know I probably wouldn't be where I am because it, we're, you know this is a multifaceted problem that I don't want to bore people with, but um, obviously the, the the readership of of the of the world is changing, right? How how people get their news. With that is you know there's this massive increase in newsprint costs. So as there are fewer papers, paper mills shut down. Having fewer paper mills, they raise their prices. So if you consider that we had a twenty some percent increase in the cost of newsprint that we buy in January, and then another forty percent coming in March, um, and that's the second busy, biggest expense of any news organization, you can kind of talk about. Um, you know, some of the troubles that we are facing uh, in, in, with print journalism. At the same time, we are suffering greatly from the same issues that other businesses are, are is finding people to work. Uh, no one wants to get up at three o'clock in the morning anymore to grab papers and drop them off at people's doorsteps. I was in a call this morning where we have 15 unmanned routes right now that other people have to make up. It's, just, it's an industry that's getting tougher and tougher to sustain. And again, I say this with all kind of pain in my heart. My father was a newspaper editor. I've been in this for a very long time. Um, I think when you when we talk about support, it's really about, and I don't care which news organization it is, but people need to subscribe to things and they need to support this. We need to support Delaware Public Media, you know? Do you subscribe to the News Journal? Do you do you subscribe to the Independent in, in Sussex County or, or Bay to Bay News or what have you? You know, it's not gonna offend me if someone's subscribing to another paper, you know, but we should be supporting journalism in one way or another. But I really think, you know, uh, we've made it. We made a dramatic change recently of, of eliminating the Saturday edition and having an e edition, which is the print experience, but it's digitally. And what, that, what we're trying to do is see if we can bridge people from one to the other. As we're, there's no plans to cut more that I know of at the moment. But you know, can you bridge people with the experience of print, but it's still digital? It's it's just a tough, tough, 
tough formula, which is which is why we're putting a lot of time, effort, and money into into digital experience, being digital only subscribers, reaching people socially, reaching people alternative means, newsletters, things like that, and trying to reach people. Um, you know, we're trying real hard to keep those papers getting to everybody's front door. It just it gets to be a bigger challenge every day. I, you know, uh, period. You know, it's tough. <laughs> Akima, did you want to say something? I did have a question um, <laughs> just around that. I couldn't unmute. I don't know why. Uh, I thought the technical difficulties It's all fine. We're going to be great. Um, but I had a question just around, you know, looking at Delaware and the Delaware demographic as it pertains to um, not even just communities of color, but also low income communities and the digital divide. And so trying to figure out bridging that, like in your, in your work to diversify the newsroom and diversify the representation and kind of get folks into those different communities that have since been, you know, that have been forgotten about in the past. Are you finding that there are specific ways that you have to engage in those communities to address those issues as well, or is that something that hasn't even come up as yet? No, it, it has come up, and, I, and 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 the the first step in that process is being there, right? And I think that's the the step that we're in now is how do we get more? So we hired a young reporter named Jose, a very talented young man, and and. Um, during uh, the interview process when we talked about like what his beat would be and again internally we call it kind of underserved communities but he can call himself whatever he wants and he's like well what is it what is my job and I was like well you're going to tell me what your job is so I'm not going to create a beat for you I, I just want to let you go and then we're going to talk every once in a while and kind of create this beat so we're in the phase now where I think we have to be there right we got to show people that we're there and again we're not putting up the mission accomplished banner by any means right I think I'll probably be long out of this business before uh, we could ever say that. But you know, you gotta start and you gotta, you, you gotta uh, start by doing again. Um, so, you know, he's having, so we hired a second person, Anitra, and she's doing kind of the same thing. And, you know, we're seeing where that's building. So that's kind of where we're in that growth environment. And li li listen, our company is offering subscriptions for a dollar for six months. So it's really like they're getting these, uh, they're getting the price of these things as low as possible. So we're trying in many ways to get different groups, different people, and, you know, people to read us. Um, but we're just starting by being there and kind of showing people that we're going to be out there. And that's kind of the phase that I think we're in right now. Can I jump in there as well? Please. Because um, Akima, because this is also somebody, somebody in the chat asked if um, if online programs for Del Shakes had helped us reach a more diverse theater group. And honestly, I'm not not sure about that. Um, I think most of our online material was kind of just keeping us in, in, in touch with the audience that we already have. So I think for us, the, the tactics that we have found that have most allowed us to build relationships with, with diverse audiences, or just as Michael said, we're, are, are going there. You know, so our, our community tour goes out into the community and goes to community centers and throughout the world. Um, and then this past fall, we, we did an experiment and did a production at Rodney Square. Um, and our our audiences at Rockwood Park tend to be probably almost 90% white. Um, and when we were at Rodney Square, those audiences were more like 30% um, of, of audiences of color. So we find that, you know, part of the experiment we have to do is like, we can't, if we really want to serve our, our full community, we can't just do things the way we've always done them and have to look at where do we deliver our product and, and how do we get that? And, and for theater, which is so much an, an in-person, I, I don't know if the digital really helped us with that, but physically going to different places um, has helped us more with that. Thank you um, so much for that. Um, Akima, you should like been the panelist. You got awesome questions. <laughs> um, I just want to say one thing. One, I did have a paper route for one year when I started my business because you know the first year in business you make no money and it helped me survive but it was hard <laughs> getting up every morning at three o'clock seven days a week seven days a week people just note that um and one of the things I was thinking about as you said that Michael is that I know that they're a dollar for some subscriptions but then they end up like after a certain period of time going up is there any thought into and I know this is not a thing I always think like sponsoring a subscription for people and I know you can do that by charging one population more and another population less, but or someone's a a, a bit a customer for so long and their their price goes up. But I'm just wondering if 
because sometimes what people will do is go PDF in all honesty, yeah. um, because they want everyone, especially if it's a, a political story or it's definitely talking about race. Yeah, or we something. don't encourage that because yeah. it's a copyright of course, violation. Of course. <laughs> but, I'm not, um, yes, I got you. Yeah. Yeah. No, but in all seriousness, there are things. Uh, I, I was uh, uh, talking with a, uh, a colleague up in Bergen, New Jersey, and they are looking at sponsorships with libraries and sponsorships with school yeah. districts and sponsorships with colleges and things right. like that. That maybe a subscription is part of whatever, or maybe if you remember the library, blah, 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 blah. So there are avenues to begin those reach out programs. So That's great. I remember when I was a kid, my dad would go to the library and all the papers would be on those huge wooden racks. Anybody remember? Okay. Oh, yeah. And, and he would sit there and read through like three different papers while I was doing whatever I was doing. But I guess digitally that can be done as well. Mm -hmm. And um, <clears throat> um, uh, Akima, can you talk a bit more about um, BIPOC and science fiction? I love Octavia Butler. Um, <coughs> and you need to unmute. <laughs> um, sure. So I let me just check the chat because I don't think I fully understand the question. Is there more to it? Um, um, no, I think she's just talking about um, the. The participation of the BIPOC community in science fiction oh, and yeah. is that growing is that you know because like you oh, said yes. you love it right oh, yes so and there's there's long since been a history of <laughs> like there is and Octavia Butler is actually a great example of this um in that there's always been sort of a, a fascination with the science fiction and and science fiction has often been a way to make sense of the somewhat incredulous. Um, and so I think there's a lot of, there are a lot of authors and writers who address colonialism and who address racism and apartheid and different things, but from a sci-fi perspective, I think we're starting to see an uptick in this, um, partially because as we talk about diversifying and looking at different audiences and what they want, um, again, BIPOC folks want to see themselves in the stories that they love. We want to see ourselves in, you know, the rom-com. We want to see ourselves in the sci-fi. We want to see ourselves in this Afrofuturism. Black Panther did a great job of like really bringing in not only the concept of Afrofuturism, but also the context of race and addressing race and racism and how it plays out throughout the diaspora. And so um, I think that was phenomenal. So yeah, I, I think we're starting to see an uptick in that. I think we're starting to see a lot of writers really delve into, and we're seeing a rebirth of Octavia Butler's work as well. So I think that also, as we see that resurgence, we start to see an uptick in some of the interest in how people begin to explore some of her ideals and you know some of her work and, and stories and things of that nature. And so, um, yeah, it, it's coming about. I myself have like three sci-fi scripts that I'm, <laughs> I'm like always tinkering with and playing with because I would love to see, I, I just would love to see that come on screen. And I think there are so many different levels and layers that you can play with in that regard as it pertains to, you know, science fiction, futurism, all those different kinds of things. And so it's definitely something we're seeing a resurgence of. I, my only caveat is I just want them to do it well. I don't want it to be rushed. I don't, there's nothing worse than a bad sci-fi film. And just being completely transparent, I don't want to see a horrible sci-fi film that has a bunch of people of color just so you can say you checked off two boxes. Like, I, I don't want that. I don't want that. Um, I want to see us really engage in it and delve into it and do it well. So, and you have to make yeah. it. You have to make it. I'm for it. So just really <laughs> quick, like complete and total shameless plug, Delaware Please. Film Incentive. Let's go. I'm just, okay. That's. <laughs> yeah. Yes. And so talk a little bit about that because the reason that I found mm -hmm. you was someone said you were starting a Delaware. It, it wasn't your nonprofit. It was a Delaware. Um, Delaware I Collective for Creative Economy. And, and that, and yes. The Delaware Collective for Creative Economy is an <laughs> informal association of creatives throughout the state of Delaware who want to see Delaware develop an infrastructure for creative economists of color um, and for profit. So it's really looking at how do we address an equitable creative economy, but also how do we look at 
um, building out beyond just the, the nonprofit sector. So Delaware has a very strong nonprofit arts and culture sector in terms of its funding. It is the, you know, what are we, the third smallest state? And yet we were like, also number three in the country, second smallest state. So then we were third, but number three in the country for our arts and profit, our arts and culture funding, like maybe four years ago. So when you look, now we're like number six. So we're dropping down a little bit. People are starting to surpass us. But when you consider a, a state that small is putting that much money into its nonprofit arts and culture, that says that this is a value and this is important. What we oftentimes forget, though, is that there's also, um, <laughs> I don't know what that says. I'll come back to it, Ms. Cook. Um, but it's, it's also looking at how do we include and integrate the for-profit artists who are also in this space. And when we look at arts and culture in the state, I think it's something like one billion um, is contributed to the GDP for the state each year. However, of that one billion, almost two thirds of it comes from the for-profit sector, but there's no structure. So we have a nonprofit structure, we don't have a for-profit structure. And so I'm always of the vein that, yes, you can do a lot with a little, but that doesn't mean you keep doing a lot with a little. It means that is demonstration of your ability to be frugal and to be creative and now give me more so I can do even more with it and be even better versus give me less and see how much longer I can, you know, sustain like this. So that is, um, that's a big, big, big thing right now. And we've been having a lot of conversations, wonderful conversations, but it comes down to Delaware acknowledging and valuing its for-profit artists and for-profit creatives and looking at how they can better support them with necessary policy and infrastructure throughout the state. So it's a big, 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 big deal <laughs> for us. <laughs> big, big deal. Um, yeah, if folks want to support that, it's at DE Art Economy on all the social media platforms where we're trying to, we want to, and you don't just have to be a filmmaker. Just let me just be clear. We are looking at the creative economy. So that includes, yes, film and television, but also looking at music, live performance, fashion, um, gaming, you know, software design, R&D, like th these are all part of the creative economy. Yeah, I think, I think art is, um, the creative economy is one of those things that we often discount and we expect to get for free. And I didn't realize that just generally, I, I work in social and racial justice space. So I'm always like, oh, can you do this? Or can you do that? And it's always volunteer work. And a friend of mine said to me, I said, oh, can you connect me with her? And she said, I will. She said, but you have to pay her. And I was like, okay. And she's like, we, we are tired of working for free. She's like, I know it's racial and social justice, but we still need to eat. And I was like, you're right. Like it's, it's just kind of a given because I think it's discounted a little bit as if it's a hobby. By no means is it. Very much so. Very <laughs> much. So. We, we often make, we often disassociate this idea of arts work with work. We, it's art. So you get to do this. It's looked at as something that is glamorous and off to the side. And, you know, you get to participate. Like that's your desire, your passion, you know, versus the work that often has to go into that. And as I even said, you know, at the very beginning, when you look at film workers, people are leaving the industry after, you know, 25 years with bodies that have aged more than, you know, twice of their actual biological age because of the amount of work they're doing and the duration with which they're doing it every day. But when you watch Iron Man or you watch, you know, Black Panther, you're like, yeah, and that's it. You, you're not taking into account that this took work. This took hundreds of people getting divorced, must be like totally getting divorced, not spending time with their children, having all kinds of issues, um, substance abuse, all these things, because it is work and the, the perils that are associated with any other job and the, the issues around doing that job especially high pressure, long-term jobs and long-time jobs where you're spending all this time at your particular workplace, um, they exist in our industry. And so when we're talking about artists, 
it's all right there. And we have to, we have to look at that and see it as a value issue and change the way that we talk about what it means to create our art and not only in the nonprofit space, because I am here for it. And David, no, I am here for it. I think it needs to be a both and not an either or. Absolutely. But until we acknowledge that, you know, there is also this other end, we can't have the both and if, if we don't acknowledge it. And I'll, you know, just because this is the topic of the conversation tonight, when we talk about Black Lives Matter, no one is saying other lives don't matter. <laughs> We're saying we need to incorporate and include that Black Lives Matter too, because if we don't, then these other things can't, you know, we can't say all lives matter if we're not also saying Black Lives Matter. So it's the same kind of concept of until we acknowledge that we do have for-profit artists who are here, who can contribute, who need to be seen, then it we have to include, otherwise we can't have the both in, we can never get there. So yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think Delaware is a great art hub um, you know, we're, we're close to all the places. I mean, we've had amazing people live here throughout history <clears throat> that have performed. Um, and I don't know if any of you have gone to the, the Jazz Fest, um, but it is like one of only free, amazing Jazz Fest. Like I, I had a friend who moved here and she said, do you know that, that, that these cost a lot of money somewhere else? Like you're getting this amazing content for like three days and it's free. And, and I was like, really? And she's like, yeah. She said, this thing in California, she's like, it would be like $500 for a ticket. So anyway, if you guys have not ever appreciated, um, go to Rodney Square. Usually have really nice weather for it. Um, at least get one night. There's three or four nights of it. But um, I think somebody asked, but I, you might have said it, Akima. Um, you mentioned the, the title of that organization. Do you want to put it in the chat for people? Do you mind? You're on mute. <laughs> yep. It's not a Zoom call if you don't mute yourself and talk. Yes, it's, that's not, right. it's not real. It's not that's a right. webinar. Um, right. I, I have a mug that says you're on mute. Yeah. <laughs> I said my um my screen is gonna go blank because I'm on my phone, but I will I will put it here uh, in the chat. Okay, great. Well, um, do do we have any other questions? Otherwise, we're gonna um, wrap up. If anybody has any other questions, you can go ahead and pop them in the chat. Um, and if I didn't get to someone, go ahead and stick that in. You can reissue that into the chat. Um, but this is a great conversation. Thank you, guys. I love to have the, the different angles. Um, you all brought so much to the space. It's, it's really appreciated. And now you know each other. And who knows what happens out there in the, in the media world. Um, I will say one of the things when I do um, a lot of talking about unconscious bias is this is one of my little tricks and Dave has probably heard this in my in my um, spiel before, but one of the games, not even games, one of the things I like to do is when I'm watching movies or TV or even looking, I, I notice right away when there's an unconscious bias happening and I don't turn it off, but I point it out to myself. And it happens more and more and more and more and more and more and more frequently, whether it be sexism, racism. You know, I went back to watch the 70s show a couple months ago and I was like, whoa, it is so sexist. It's crazy. But it's just what we've taken in our whole lives. And sometimes we wonder why we are where we are. And it's because we take in media unconsciously all the time. So let me see. I think there was one more thing, but um, okay, I came up with that. I'll give everybody a second to take that on. Do you guys um, just give you a minute to close out and, and say good night? And um, we'll start with David. Kima still, or do you want to go first? Akima, you about to lose your battery or something? No, I, oh. I don't, I don't, I actually don't know what's going on myself, but I can go first. Um, I just wanted to say again, thank you so, so much for, you know, providing the space for this conversation and for us to really look around this. And I, I would absolutely love to find ways to continue this conversation and deepen this conversation over time. And especially as we begin to grow our creative economy and our film production hub and space here in Delaware, and just really looking at how we can ensure that we are addressing those unconscious biases and, and really creating something equitable um, and inclusive for everyone. So thank you all for, you know, allowing us to be here and have this space. Thank you. I'll let one of you guys go. <laughs> All right, I'll go. Uh, I, I too want to thank everybody. And um, 
you know, it, it's interesting to me that our job is to tell stories, but sometimes we, as journalists, we don't tell our own story very well uh, and what we're trying to do and as an organization and, and how what we're trying to affect change. And we do a horrible job of telling our own story. So I thank you for giving us the time here to let me talk a little bit about the direction that we're going. And uh, uh, I appreciate that very much. And I thank everybody for listening. Yeah, thank you for keeping these conversations going. Um, just kind of close with what one story as to as to why we need to keep keep talking about representation and, and biases. Um, we uh, we took our our production of Romeo and Juliet on tour to Delaware State University um, and performed twice there for for students, uh, multicultural cast. Um, and when I was talking to one of the professors uh, a few weeks later, I asked her, "Well, what what feedback did your students have?" And she said they to a person said it was so good to see because we didn't realize that black actors could do Shakespeare if it wasn't Othello. Um, and that just that kind of you know, <laughs> made me collapse because that that's what our industry has done over over the years is to is to say who can be in what kind of roles. Um, and we need to create a world where we can step into roles uh, wherever wherever um, the the person is right right to do it. Um, and it's only by, and as you said, Becca, as soon as you, you start noticing it, you can't stop noticing it um, when, you, when you see these unconscious biases playing out in, in entertainment. Um, so I thank everyone for, for listening in to try to become better, better aware of that and how we can make differences together. Thank you. And um, please keep following us on social media. Check out our website. Um, we are running to Michael's point about storytelling. We're running an amazing program right now. It's a pilot program. Um, and it's um, trans transformational racial healing conversations. And it's really just storytelling. Um, and it's in a circle process, which is where you're not having cross conversations. It's, it's really been the most moving, I'm a facilitator, but it's really been one of the most moving experiences of my life since I've had this job to watch people share things that um, ordinarily they wouldn't share and just see, I'm gonna go back to David's point in the community, humanity, see the humanity in each other and understanding that we all go through pain and, um, and we all go have joy. So good night, everybody. Thank you.